Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, Sunday. Um, we're here in London. Uh, where are we? Sixth week of lockdown, just finishing. So looking forward to starting the seventh week uh, tomorrow. Um, not a situation I would have expected to any of us, any of us to have found ourselves in. Um, but uh, here we are on Elevenses, trying to make the most of it uh, by providing you with some uh, biking news, uh, some controversial views and some tips as well around motorcycling. What have we got for you today? Uh, well, I'm going to talk about Tesla briefly, first of all. Um, we've got a story about a motorcyclist who was apparently targeted deliberately in a fatal collision. Uh, got a quick item on a, a stretch motorcycle from India. Uh, we'll look at the DVSA and how they're offering some advice to uh, motorcycle trainers for key worker tests. And last but not least, we'll look at uh, biking fitness. And today I'll look at uh, leg strength, which is uh, something we tend to forget about when we're riding a motorcycle. Um, right, okay. Um, and before I go any further, yeah, one apology on the uh, 
yet another disastrous attempt to run the science of being seen presentation. I still have no idea what caused it, although um, when I logged into the studio software this morning, um, a an alert popped up which said there is actually a bug in, in Chrome-based browsers which is causing the screen share facility not to work properly. And uh, as I'm using the screen share on um, to show the presentation while I'm sort of on screen as well, uh, it's possible that is the problem. I'll look into that. Their workaround is to use Firefox, uh, which I don't actually have installed, um, but I'll have a look at that and see if I can do anything about it. But uh, apart from uh, failing that, I will get that uh, presentation pre-recorded and then put up as a um, a, a an independent um, piece for you at some point. I'll get around to it when I can. Uh, don't forget, if you've got anything to say, any comments, uh, questions, uh, use the usual chat box at the bottom and I'll get back to you when I go off the live show. All right. OK, so on with the first story. Well, uh, US car maker Tesla is under fire again. They're um, set to be sued by the family of a Japanese man. Um, he was one of the first to be killed, apparently, by one of the cars when it was being driven on the autopilot mode. Uh, Tomomi Yumida, uh, the wife of the deceased, told the Northern District of California on Tuesday this week that whilst Tesla is likely to blame the driver for being drowsy whilst driving the vehicle, uh, the, they feel that the crash should have been prevented by better technology when within the autopilot feature. Now, this isn't the first time that Tesla's come under fire, uh, and its semi-autonomous cars have been criticised by um, safety groups. Um, back in May 2018, I actually wrote about a self-driving Tesla which had hit a parked police car in California. The problem seems to be, or at least it is to my mind anyway, and I talk as a, not a non-expert on car automation, but as a potential user at some point in the future, uh, the problem seems to be the way the Tesla autopilot is constructed, because it isn't actually an autopilot. At least it's not an autopilot in the way that the self-driving mode in Google Cars takes complete control of the vehicle. Uh, Teslas have the hardware which allows them to self-drive, but the current implementation is basically cruise control plus, if you like, as uh, somebody put it a couple of years ago on my page. And I honestly struggle to understand how the basic concept of a self-driving car that isn't actually fully capable of controlling itself and actually requires a backup driver mode it can be a safe and sound strategy for a car on the road in any shape or form. Now, something that humans are notoriously bad at is monitoring. doesn't matter whether you're putting somebody in front of a gauge and telling them to keep an eye on it uh, and make sure it doesn't deviate outside a particular range. It doesn't matter whether it's somebody scanning CCTV images and watching for things going on. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a highly trained technician scanning um, cancer cells uh, in samples. Um, it's something that we don't do well. Humans just don't function in that kind of way uh, very effectively. Yet here, what we are essentially selling people is a, is a car that can point itself in roughly the right direction, but actually needs constant supervision to make sure it's doing exactly what it should be doing. So I, f I find that to make no logical sense whatsoever. It's an engineering solution that doesn't actually do a complete job to solving the problem of a self-driving car. Um, it seems to me that either the car should do it all while the driver is perfectly capable of taking a nap, or the driver remains 100% the vehicle operator with the car systems now acting as a backup to the driver and coming online when the driver needs nudging uh, to do something that they uh, may be not doing or possibly even to take full control in an emergency and do something like apply the brakes harder than the driver's applying them. But what we have is uh, essentially a halfway house where the uh, the vehicle operator isn't actually operating the vehicle, but it's still required to be as completely mentally alert as they were. So, uh, 
uh, as if they were driving the car. They have to be hands-on on the wheel, uh, hands-on or feet-on on the pedals, and yet they're still they're relying on the drivers, driver the subsystems within the vehicle itself to do all those driving decisions for them. And I, I cannot see for the life of me why that is ever considered to be an effective solution to this problem. It seems to me to be a technology showcase for the sake of a technology showcase. Um, as it happens, now back after the 2018 crash, um, I'd completely forgotten this until I checked my own notes this morning, um, I did catch the tail end of an interview with somebody from the insurance industry, and I did actually mean to look this up and have got round to it. But basically what she said in the segment of the interview that I did hear was that in her view, the technology would eventually move away from self-driving uh fully autonomous vehicles back towards the idea of providing highly sophisticated driver aids for those vehicles right okay whether that will be the case or not is anybody's guess but um we will find out no doubt in due course right don't forget you are watching uh, survival skills and uh do drop me a line if you've got anything to say about uh, what I've just talked about, because I know that it, um, it is a hot potato and a lot of people have different views and ideas on that. Um, all right. OK, so what's the next story? Well, um, most cyclist was killed in a crash uh, in Dover Court, which is near Harwich, uh, on the 15th of April. And the police have arrested somebody in connection with murder. Um, Karen Repman, 29, was killed when his motorcycle was struck by a BMW in what the police have described as a targeted crash. Um, two air ambulances, uh, multiple paramedics and ambulance officers were all called to the scene. The biker, who was in his 20s, was pronounced dead at the scene. Um, but an 80-year-old woman, a pedestrian, was also hit and injured in the collision. She was subsequently transported to hospital. Well, she hasn't got any uh, not life-threatening injuries, apparently. But the following day, the police said that they believed that this crash which was what they called targeted. Police spokesman said a uh, detective now believe that this was a target incident and are treating his death, death as murder. Two men were seen leaving the scene and they are thought to have been in the BMW. We'd like to speak with anyone who may have been uh, may have been present at the time of the incident and seen these men. Um, Essex police said that uh, a 33-year-old woman from Waltham Cross has been arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender. A, a man aged 19 was previously arrested on suspicion of murder and attempted murder, and he was released on bail until 19th of May. And police also said that two other men, aged 46 and 54, have both been released under investigation. Um, and the detectives are continuing to search for a Keith McCarthy, aged 40, who they also want to speak to. He's described as five foot five, uh, 165 centimetres. Uh, believed to have links to Harwich, Hertfordshire, London and Ireland. And Crime Stoppers also issued a £5,000 reward for information on that particular incident. So it's a bit of a strange one there. Um, just a reminder, you're watching Survival Skills and Kevin Williams here and uh, the webcast 11s is. Um, we're going to move on to the stretch motorcycle in India, and uh, then we've got some DAVSA guidance to trainers, and we're going to finish the show with a biking fit. Uh, so, okay, um, bike made for social distancing. Now, I popped the motorcycle picture up already on the comments there, so hopefully you've seen that. Um, I won't attempt to mangle the pronunciation of the Indian gentleman's name, but uh, this lash up was built in the Indian state of Tripura, which is way up in the northeast. And the idea is to maintain social distancing and avoid having his daughter using the school bus. Now, effectively, what he did was uh, he took the engine out of his motorbike, uh, so presumably a scooter looking at the structure, uh, cut it in two, stuck a big piece of metal between the front and the back half and connected it together again um, and fitted electric power. So the bike has a battery, which is what you can see perched on the frame in the middle there, and there's an engine at the back connected by a chain to the back wheel. And uh, he claims that it can travel... Um, three hours on a charge, uh, sorry, three 
80 kilometers on a three hour chart, that's uh, correct, and travels at about 40 kilometers per hour. But quite frankly, looking at it, I'm not sure I want to go a lot quicker on something with a wheelbase of that length. Uh, I'm not overly convinced by the engineering either. If you look at it, there definitely seems to be a bit of a kink in the middle of that beam. Um, hopefully, it will be retired uh, before it actually snaps in two. Um, it's not the only example of uh, engine, uh, ingenuity coming out of India. Uh, an e-rickshaw driver in West Bengal apparently divided his rickshaw into four separate compartments to uh, comply with the sort of social distancing issues. Um, Apparently, as well, the Mahindra Group chairman, uh, Anand Mahindra himself, wanted to recruit him for the company's R&D development uh, com part department. And frankly, the mind boggles as to what they could come up with together, if that was the case. OK, so just a reminder, you are watching Elevenses. Um, my paperback books are still on offer, uh, although the publisher website's in a bit of a mess at the moment. I haven't been able to get back onto it and see what's going on over there. But uh, you can read even if you can't write. And don't forget, I do have all those articles which are written on Facebook, and I have been moving them to my coffee site as well. There's a whole of 2014's Tips on Tuesday and Skills on Saturday, 100 items available for you to read on, on there. Um, right, OK, so where are we now? Um, well, moving on to the DVSA, um, they've issued some guidance on how motorcycle trainers should be dealing with the problem of earpieces on critical worker tests. Now, um, we've had various amounts of training guidance issued uh, about training critical workers in the past. Um, but um, one of the problems that the trainers obviously have is that a lot of the equipment is actually shared between riders. Um, helmets are obviously one ish item, which um, training schools generally provide to their trainees. Uh, gloves are another item and whilst you can argue that uh, people well they can go out and buy a helmet if that's serious that they want to get onto a bike during the coronavirus lockdown they can buy their own helmets and gloves and after all a uh, legal helmet and uh, legal glove brand new one aren't going to set you back a great deal of money and it'll do the job um one thing that uh, trainers do rely on and so does the examiner it's a radio system and the radio system obviously has to have an earpiece which goes inside the helmet and this is, has caused some problems trainers uh, some trainers are trying to keep costs down by sterilizing the earpiece after use others have gone the route of uh, using cheap disposable earpieces and uh, or telling people to bring their own most of these radios are now bluetooth connections or uh, some trainers are still using the old PMR uh, radios, but they virtually all take a standard 3.5 millimeter audio jack, the sort of thing you'd find on the end of an ordinary set of uh, earphones. Um, so it's not beyond the, you know, again, the capability of a trainee to bring their own earpieces in. Um, but it is important that, uh, you know, vehicles, the vehicles themselves are kept clean and that it's really important that trainers don't share PPE, in my opinion. Anybody who's trying to do things like sterilise the inside of a helmet is onto a, a really sticky wicket. And there was an inquiry the other day on one of my bike forums from somebody saying, "How can I, you know, where can I get disposable helmet liners?" Well, if somebody's wearing a helmet for three or four hours on a CBT, um, and you've just got a, a liner inside it, even paper one or a washable cotton thing, you're really not acting as much of a barrier between that and the inside line of the helmet. So quite frankly, I would say to anybody who's listening who runs a bike training school, um, you cannot share a helmet. You have to get the trainee to supply their own. If they're coming back to do a repeat CBT, if they're a critical worker, then they should have one anyway. And if they are a critical worker who wants to use a bike, for a CB to, uh, for work purposes to get to work, then again, they will need a helmet anyway. So why is the training school even beginning to think about trying to supply this equipment? It just doesn't make any kind of sense to me. 
Um, but the earpiece is something a little bit, as I say, there is a bit of a problem with this. So the DVSA's um, solution to this, and you have to say we're now into May and six weeks of lockdown. How come it's taken the DVSA quite so long to come up with a press release to this point? Um, the DVSA are treating the candidate earpieces as single use, and um, they will continue to provide an earpiece for the Module 2 test but they will then dispose of that earpiece at the end of the test. And they say that's safer for the examiner and the candidates and then trying to make sure the earpiece is clean for the next candidate. Well, absolutely. And, you know, quite frankly, I can't see how on earth that, that wasn't, um, that information wasn't provided to training schools right from the off. So basically what they're saying is that uh, the candidates should bring their in own in-ear headphones or the training school should provide the candidate with a set and the that, that it should be then used if they possibly can or the examiner will provide a, if, a headset um, of their own if the candidate can't bring one along for the test. Um, if neither is available then the um, test will go ahead with the uh, the, the standard um, procedure for a, a radio failure. They've always had that backup. Uh, basically, the examiner stops, gives the candidate directions a couple of you know turns ahead, and uh, then they off they start again and off they go, and then they stop again and uh, so on and so forth, um, with the instructions being given at the side of the road. Um, it's perfectly legitimate to do that if a radio link fails on the test um, and you can also do that as a trainer as a cbt i'm pretty sure that that is, is still the, the case so okay um whether this is an indication of uh, any possible hint of um, the lockdown relaxation coming and how the dvsa will handle that and whether they'll be allow trainees uh, generally to get back into bike training rather than just the key workers I don't know but it uh, it points sort of way forward for schools um, it's going to you know it's going to be a problem for all schools it's going to be a problem for me but uh, it's certainly something that I'm thinking ahead about okay so all right where are we then uh, don't forget um, if you have missed a show um, you can catch up on my YouTube channel, uh, which is Survival Skills UK. Don't forget that all important UK or somebody will be showing you how to uh, skin a bear with a knife or something like that. Um, the 11 series is on 11 every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Sunday. So join me here if you can. Right. OK, on to the final story of the day. Um, I've been talking about staying biking fit over the last few weeks. Um, the thing about riding a motorcycle is it's a surprisingly good physical workout, but we just don't realize it. Um, we actually use a surprisingly uh, high number of different muscle groups. Um, we've got everything, as I said on week one, the muscles here in the forearm that operate the clutch and the brake levers, uh, down to our core muscles in the torso, which control our posture on the bike uh, as we are uh, blown backwards by the wind and we have to brace against the acceleration and deceleration forces of the bike um, but we don't actually notice how we gradually use those muscles as, as we're riding we use them uh, fairly gently but it's the repetitive nature of riding which builds up those muscles and we tend to only notice that when we've had a long layoff and then suddenly we realize just how tiring it is to ride so a there's a general level of fitness which is applicable to all all of us out there on the bike not just racers um you know even an hour long ride on the commute or uh, out for a spin in the country along a nice rural road um, if we're out of condition it'll be a lot more tiring than if we are riding regularly and there's another reason that this maintaining this basic level of fitness is important the fitter we are the longer it takes for us to be distracted by the physical discomfort, the aches and pains that come along fairly quickly once we actually start to get tired on the bike. Now, when, when we are fit, 
uh, to ride. We can ride surprisingly long distances, but it takes time to build this up. A really good example when people suddenly realise that they're not as fit as they thought they were is if they do uh, an hour's riding on sort of a Sunday afternoon or something, and then suddenly they go off for a two-week biking holiday. And the first day, people often plan to ride for six or seven hours because they want to get where they're going. And by lunchtime, they're knackered. Um, I regularly have issues with uh, people who um, have had this problem and then wonder why they weren't uh, up to the job. And the answer is basically you need to get biking fit. By the end of the two weeks, if you've ridden around regularly on that holiday, you will have gained an, a, a surprising level of extra fitness. So my advice for anybody ever uh, going off on a holiday trip is always start with a shortish ride on the first two or three days, gradually build up. So by all means, do a long ride on the way home, but take a couple of days to get where you're going rather than trying to do one massive hit on day one because you will find that you are uh, surprisingly exhausted at the end of that day. Um, okay, so general, general fitness and why it's important. But one other big muscle group that we tend to forget about when riding are the leg muscles. Um, now, why is that? Well, we're not sitting like a sack of spuds on the seat of the bike, or at least we shouldn't be. Um, if we are, there's something very wrong with our posture on the bike. Now, I mentioned just a moment ago that the forces of the wind and accelerating and braking tend to make our torso rock backwards and forwards on the bike. We can also be blown around sideways and uh, we will be bounced around over the bumps. So how do we brace ourselves against the movement? Well, a lot of riders use the bars to brace themselves, but that's a mistake. And it creates a problem for the rider too. Um, in case you hadn't actually noticed, your arms are connected to the handlebars and the handlebars are connected to the front wheel. So the problem is, if we are hanging on to the bars as we ourselves are moving around on the bike, what we tend to do is inadvertently transfer that movement into the bars and thence directly into the steering of the machine, um, which causes instability. Uh, the classic example of this is on a windy day. Um, riders get blown around physically on top of the motorcycle, so they try to hold on to the handlebars harder, and all they do is they end up transferring those gusts of wind into the bars, and the bike wobbles and weaves all over the place. The solution is not to hold on to the bars. Um, if we do that, suddenly the bike feels a lot more stable. Surprising how effective that is. Or we prevent the bars moving when we really need to be able to use them to steer. And again, we have a classic example here under hard braking. Um, as you will know, if you've carried out the module one test maneuvers, you can brake and steer at the same time. Um, however, if you are leaning hard on the handlebars because you're taking the braking force, the deceleration, which is causing your body to want to go forwards, if we're taking that by leaning on the bars, then what we're actually doing is preventing those bars moving, and it suddenly becomes very difficult indeed to steer. We actually force the bike into pretty much a straight line. Um, this, a similar kind of problem tends to happen on corners. Brake hard in the corner. The bike always wants to sit up. And we actually physically need to add some counter steering to keep the bike on line. But again, if you're leaning on the handlebars, you stop that movement of the bars and what happens then is, of course, is the bike runs wide in the corner uh, through braking. So there are lots of reasons that we need to keep the body weight away from the handlebars. Now, we can stiffen our back. That helps. But we still need something to locate the spine with. And the answer to that is with, that we use the legs. The legs lock us onto the motorcycle itself. And we do that with the knees. Um, right, now I've talked about the stability issues, but there's a second thing to consider too. Um, flexibility. When we're riding, our knees are bent. There are just a very, very few motorcycles that have a genuine armchair position where the lower limb is completely extended and there's barely any angle of the knee. Some of these super scooters get close to that kind of riding position. Uh, if you've got highway pegs on a custom, that'll have a similar sort of an armchair riding position, but that brings its own problems with backs, back uh, issues. Um, the 
even a nice sort of relaxed cruiser, which has a sort of fairly big angle between the thigh and the lower part of the leg, you're still flexed at the knee. Still quite a lot of flexion. Of course, if you're riding a sport bike, then your knee angle is usually quite extreme because your feet are tucked well back on the foot pegs. So the thing is that we get used to that riding position and you'll know that you get used to the riding position if you switch from one machine to another. If you jump off a cruiser or a tourer and you leap onto a sports bike, you'll feel like you've been bent double on a rack. Um, and if you go the other way, you'll suddenly you will feel like you're riding an armchair. So we get used to this flexure. Um, you know, it, age does mean we're a little bit less flexible. But I can still get onto a, something like a G6 GSX R and ride it without too many problems. Oddly enough, the one I do have is at my neck. Um, but as soon as we stop riding, our flexure, our uh, flexibility starts to starts to go. We start literally start to seize up. Um, so we're stopping riding. We've been off bikes now for six weeks. We're losing muscle strength and we're losing the flexure in those muscles. So some exercises. Now, as I've said several times, it's a good idea to get medical advice before any exercise regime. Um, is stop if you get any pain. Don't go any further. And remember, don't push hard with any exercise. Instead, go for repetitions. That's how you build up the muscle strength. Um, so if you're fit, what can you do to strengthen your leg muscles? Well, some squats will help. Um, they're an easy way to build leg strength. Um, but I would honestly say that if you're not actually already going to a gym or something like that, then take it easy. And those are probably too tough to start with. So have a look at that video that I've linked to on YouTube, because the uh, trainer there is offering you some easy exercises and stretches you can do in your own kitchen. Now, again, don't take offense at the fact they're aimed at seniors. Uh, most of us are probably not in the shape we could hope for. And so the exercises that are targeted at seniors are a really, really good way to for anybody to start a gentle exercise regime. Um, in particular, supporting yourself via the counter um, helps spread the effort. You can use the muscles that you want to exercise as you get fitter. But when you start off, you can use your arms to give yourself a little bit of extra support and help out those muscles that haven't done any work for a while. So have a look at that. Um, here's another exercise. Uh, you just need a plastic football for this one. Um, plastic rather than leather because plastic is um, bendy. And all you do literally is you pop the ball between your knees and you squeeze your knees together. Now, if you think about what you're doing when you're holding onto the bike around the tank, you are squeezing your legs together onto the petrol tank. So by using this very simple exercise with your knees, you will strengthen your grip on the petrol tank and make everything a lot easier. Um, we also sometimes need to take weight off the seat. Uh, for example, if we're changing body position uh, or riding the bike, maybe we are hanging off around the corner on the track. Uh, this is where I tend to find that I need this exercise. But sometimes when riding over big bumps, um, London is probably littered, as you know, A, with potholes and B, with uh, speed restricting bumps. And to get the bike to ride nicely over those, what I do is I just take my bum off the seat, lift myself out of the seat slightly, um, and that allows the bike to ride out the bump underneath me without having to deal with my suspension, uh, my weight too. So my knees effectively become the active suspension for the bike. Um, how can we work those out? Well, again, the uh, thrusts, squat thrusts help, um, but you can use this, a staircase. If you've got a staircase, then just take a step up and down, stand at the bottom, step up one, step on to the top of the, the step, uh, first one foot, then the other foot, and then go down again. Uh, again, it's a good and a very simple workout for your thighs. Um, a few weeks ago, I mentioned these things. I've actually remembered to put my prop ready. Uh, these are exercise bands, and uh, you can get them in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. But the idea is that when you stretch them, they create resistance. And the further you stretch them, the more resistance from the band. Um, start with the easy ones, build up the uh, the muscles gently, as I mentioned. And an easy exercise you can do your own armchair is basically loop the band under your foot. 
so it's down there under your foot somewhere with the other end hold it up around your knee and all you do is you push down with your foot and what you're strengthening are the muscles in your thigh and again you can do that every day every or every few days in the armchair for 10 minutes or so and you'd be amazed at how quickly you feel those thigh muscles hardening up um, so these are exercises that i personally do before i head out onto the first track session of the year we're usually out there in april or so um, after i've been usually been bike training again after that uh, for for a month or so before that but riding a track you're pushing yourself a lot harder than you do on the road and so i have found that i need to do these exercises regularly to get my legs up to scratch um, so, so I can move around on the bike and so I'm not crap, crippled by the end of the session. So, okay, that's enough for today. Um, I'll finish off this mini series next week by talking about some exercises that we can do for the upper arm and the shoulder. Um, then I'll talk about a quick roundup of the benefits of cycling generally. And that'll be pretty much it for this series. Um, so, okay, time's up for today. Um, I'll be back tomorrow. No, I won't. I'll be back. Yes, I will. Monday. That's right. Um, I've got the interview with Kate Jennings from Hideout Leather tomorrow. Um, that'll run as a special. It's uh, quite long again. We're 50 odd minutes of interview with Kate while she takes you through her leather manufacturing business and also tells us about some uh, high quality uh, textiles, something I didn't know that they made. Um, and how they've built those to be the same sort of standard as their leather riding kit. So I think that'll be a very interesting interview again for you all tomorrow. So tune in to, uh, Monday, 11 uh, a.m. And uh, we'll be having that special interview with Kate Jennings of Hideout Leather. Um, OK, so for now, thanks for watching. Hopefully uh, catch you tomorrow. All right. And don't forget the this will go up on my YouTube channel uh, uh, shortly. Okay, thanks for watching.